From VOA Learning English, this is the Agriculture Report in Special English. A small nonprofit company in Cambodia is turning used cooking oil into high quality biodiesel fuel. The idea is to reduce air pollution caused by low quality diesel made from petroleum. In Cambodia, heavy trucks usually use petroleum diesel. So do many older cars. The diesel sold in Cambodia is a high sulfur fuel. It is banned in more developed countries. Experts say diesel exhaust is a big part of air pollution in the country. And air pollution causes lung disease and other respiratory problems. Naga Biodiesel was set up in 2008 to provide a cleaner fuel choice. The company produces high quality biodiesel at a small factory in northwest Cambodia. Most of the oil is supplied by local restaurants at no cost. The restaurants then buy back the biodiesel at a 40% discount or reduced price. The cooking oil is washed and cleaned to remove contaminants before being processed into diesel. And the process of making biodiesel has a useful byproduct, glycerin, which can be used as a cleaner. The founder of Naga Biofuels says biodiesel burns cleaner in engines and helps improve the air quality in the fast-growing city of Siem Reap. Providing used cooking oil to biodiesel producers makes sense to restaurants, too. The manager of a restaurant in Siem Reap, called the Blue Pumpkin, says he does not have to worry about what to do with used cooking oil anymore. He adds, the whole service is very clean and professional. Naga Biofuels wants to increase production to 10,000 liters by 2013. The business plans to provide its service in environmentally sensitive areas where low quality diesel can cause damage. For VOA Learning English, I'm Laurel Bowman. From VOA Learning English, this is the Agriculture Report. Farmers in the eastern part of the Democratic Republic of Congo are protecting against crop theft in an unusual way. The farmers are growing crops that are less likely to be stolen. The United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization says in the past year, many farmers have started to grow different crops. Guillaume Kahomboshi is a food security expert with the FAO in Goma. He says small farmers think the wars that break out at harvest time may just be an excuse to steal their crops. Mr. Karamboshi notes that most of the people in Richuru, a territory near Uganda, are starting to grow soybeans. The expert suggests this is because soybeans are not good to eat until they have been dried and milled. He says the armed groups want food that is ready to eat. In addition, there is good demand for soybeans in Uganda for making biscuits and other processed foods. Farmers in Masisi, another war-stricken territory in Uganda, are switching to growing cassava. Frank Muki is an agronomist at Goma University. He agrees that soybeans are less likely to be stolen. But he is not so sure about cassava, which is called manioc in Congo. He says cassava 
is more of a risk because it is a staple food. Cassava is not necessarily easy to steal, but it is easily destroyed. The non-governmental organization Concern spoke with people in villages in Masisi. The group reports that there was less theft of cassava than of other crops. Years of war and ethnic conflict in parts of eastern Congo have divided communities there. This means villagers' crops are as likely to be stolen by their neighbors as by the armed groups. For VOA Learning English, I'm Carolyn Prasuti. This is the VOA Special English Agriculture Report. Farmers in Haiti plant about 60% of their crops in the spring. But this spring is a struggle with disaster. The January 12th earthquake flattened much of the capital and surrounding areas. It left more than 200,000 people dead and about a million homeless. International recovery plans include helping Haiti expand food production. But now, seasonal rains do not make the situation any easier. The rains continue through May and June. Farmers in the quake area lost tools as the shaking caused landslides that buried equipment. Also, many farmers need money for seeds and fertilizer. And Sabina Vilka of the aid group CARE says many lack the money to hire help to prepare the land. For the planting, they also need local labor, she says. And since they do not have enough money to hire people, the work will simply not be done. The United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization said it has delivered tools and seeds to thousands of families in the quake area. The earthquake was centered near Port-au-Prince. An estimated 600,000 people left for the countryside. Experts say it will be difficult to feed them. Food prices are high, and many people fled the capital with only the clothes they were wearing. Gerald Murray at the University of Florida is an expert on Haiti. He says many rural families have taken in relatives and friends who lost homes and jobs. There may be enough to eat for a while, he says, but before too long, there may be hunger. Farming is about 60% of Haiti's economy but most food comes from imports. Before the quake, the government and private groups were working to improve agriculture. Deforestation is a major problem. There are few trees to protect soil from floods, droughts, and severe storms. In the 1600s, Haiti's French colonizers cleared forests to plant sugarcane. In the 1950s, forests were cut down for wood and other products. Poor technology and poor roads also reduced agricultural production. So did animal and plant diseases. Farmers moved to cities. Professor Murray says the average farm in Haiti is about one to one and a half hectares. Fields are commonly divided between level ground and a mountainside. And that's the VOA Special English Agriculture Report, available at voaspecialenglish.com and on Twitter and Facebook 
at VOA Learning English. This is the VOA Special English Agriculture Report. Weather does not discriminate between large and small farms. If it rains too much or too little, crop insurance can pay for losses. Yet insurance usually costs too much for a farmer with as little as a hectare or two of land. But now a program called Kilimo Salama, or Safe Farming, offers low-cost insurance in parts of Kenya. The program is offered by the Syngenta Foundation. The foundation was established by the Swiss agricultural chemical maker Syngenta. Farmers register at businesses taking part in the program and receive a policy number through their mobile phone. Every time the farmers buy seeds, fertilizer, or other inputs, they pay an extra 5% in addition to the price. This extra cost is the insurance premium. The farmers are paid back for the inputs if their crops fail because of drought or flood. The program is designed for maize and wheat farmers like Josephat Langat. He owns a two-hectare farm near Eldoret in western Kenya. He said, in a case where we do not have a lot of rainfall, it means we are going to lose all the crops. But this insurance policy is going to cover the farm inputs that we use in the farms. So that is going to give us the certainty of going back to the farms again if the rains do not come. He buys his agricultural inputs at Maraba Investments in Eldoret. About 200 farmers signed up for the insurance within the first two weeks that it was offered there. Beatrice Kemboy is a director of the business. She says every day she and her workers register from five to ten farmers in the program. When farmers buy their inputs, the store worker uses a mobile phone camera to scan barcode symbols that match the product. A text message confirming the policy number and sale is then sent automatically. The program also uses solar-powered weather stations to record local rainfall amounts. The data is sent to the UAP insurance company. When there is crop failure because of a drought or flood, farmers receive a text message. It tells them to receive payment from the business where they purchase their inputs. And that's the VOA Special English Agriculture Report. You can read and listen to our reports at voaspecialenglish.com. And you can add your comments. We are also on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and iTunes at VOA Learning English. From VOA Learning English, this is the Agriculture Report in Special English. Some private game farmers in South Africa are hiring armed protection for their rhinos. New security companies are being started to fight an increase in rhinoceros poaching. Poachers are now well armed and well financed. A single horn sells for more than $65,000 per kilogram. That is more valuable than gold. Rhino horns are sold mostly in Vietnam and China. People there wrongly believe that the material in the horn can cure all kinds of problems.
Simon Rood started a security company in South Africa five years ago when rhino poaching started to increase. His 35 rangers supervise an area of 150,000 hectares in Limpopo province. Simon Rood was a soldier in the South African army and gives military training to his rangers. He says they have never lost a rhino to poaching. This, he says, is because his rangers patrol 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and live and sleep in the countryside. Callie Bota manages a wildlife business that had six rhinos. Recently, he found one dead with its horns cut off. He owned the rhino for 12 years. Replacing a rhino costs about $28,000. But Callie Bota says armed protection also costs a lot and he worries about his own safety. So he may stop breeding rhinos. He says the risk is too high. Other wildlife businesses are willing to pay to protect their rhinos. Karen Trendler works at South Africa's only rhino orphanage. She thinks there should be a law to establish rules for training. If security companies are not well trained, she says, there is a risk of corruption. She says a long-term solution will come through education and law enforcement. For VOA Learning English, I'm Carolyn Prasuti. This is the VOA Special English Agriculture Report. Most kinds of rose plants are native to Asia, but roses also grow in other parts of the world including Northwest Africa, Europe, and the United States. In 1986, Congress and President Ronald Reagan declared the rose as America's national floral emblem. They proclaimed it the national flower, in other words. But whatever the name, the choice of the rose did not smell very sweet to supporters of other popular flowers. Some say roses are difficult to grow, but you have a better chance of success if you start with a few suggestions from experts. First, choose a place to grow your roses where they can get sunshine for about six hours on bright days. You can buy roses from a garden center or by mail. You can buy potted roses, also known as container roses, or bare root plants. Each kind has its fans. Some gardeners say potted roses are easier to plant. They say the roots develop better if you start with potted roses. But others point out that bare root roses come without soil, so they weigh less to transport, and that can save money. The University of Illinois Extension advises getting bare root roses as close to planting time as you can. If they arrive before you are ready to plant them, make sure the packing material is moist. Keep the plants in a cool, dark place. You plant the roses while they are dormant. The resting plants have no leaves but still need water. When growing roses, the soil should feel moist deep down. Watering should be done in the morning. You can avoid problems like black spot and mildew that way. Be careful not to water roses too much. Too much water can cause unhealthy discoloration on the leaves. After heavy rains or too much watering, 
try temporarily pulling away mulch from around the roots. Doing that will help dry the soil. Placing mulch around rose plants is normally a good idea. Mulch suppresses weeds and holds moisture in the soil. You can use mulch made from bark, pine needles, cotton seed, or oak leaves. If the soil is very dry, you can add peat or compost to help condition it. If aphids, thrips, or other insects invade your rose bushes, you may be able to force them off with just a strong spray of water. For VOA Special English, I'm Mario Ritter. Share your secrets about growing roses at voaspecialenglish.com. This is the VOA Special English Agriculture Report. People have grown chrysanthemums for more than 2,000 years. Chinese and other Asian cultures make tea with the flowers. But mums also make bright and colorful gardens. One basic kind of mum is the hardy or garden mum. The other basic kind is the florist mum. The garden mum is better able to handle different growing conditions than the florist mum. There are many varieties of mums. The decorative mum is often seen in gardens. Another popular type, the quill mum, has long straight petals like a tube or needle. Chrysanthemum blooms can be white, yellow, gold, red, or other colors. The plants often grow to one meter in height. The soil should be kept moist but well drained so it does not get too wet. Newly planted mums should be watered two or three times a week depending on conditions. Plants established in the ground may do well just with normal rainfall. In dry conditions, they will need more water. Mums grow best in full sunshine. They produce colorful blooms when days get shorter and nights get longer. The life cycle of the plant depends on the amount of daylight. This is why experts advise against placing mums near nightlights or streetlights. The light may interfere with their normal growth cycle. The plants may develop buds too soon. In climates where temperatures fall below freezing, plant mums at least six weeks before the first frost is expected. That way, the plants will be well established for cold weather. Placing mulch around the plants can protect them from the cold. Doug Akers from the Cooperative Extension Service at Purdue University in Indiana suggests straw or shredded leaves for the mulch. The material will also add nutrients to the soil. Some gardeners say the most beautiful presentation comes from planting mums close together but they also advise leaving enough space between the plants so air can flow. If not, the chance of disease may increase. To get more blooms, gardeners pinch back the branches when new growth has extended to 15 centimeters. Squeeze about 5 to 7 centimeters off each branch. Pinch again when a branch grows another 12 to 15 centimeters. Stop pinching about 100 days before you want the plants to bloom. And that's the VOA Special English Agriculture Report. You can find all of our reports with transcripts and MP3s 
at voaspecialenglish.com. You can also comment on your own experience growing mums. From VOA Learning English, this is the Agriculture Report. There's always work to do in a garden, but some plants need less work than others. Beets are a root vegetable that do not need a lot of care. People might think beets are always dark red, but they can also be pink, yellow, or white. Beets are high in nutrients, including folate, iron, and fiber. They can be used fresh or frozen, canned or pickled. And not just the root, but also the tops can be eaten. The leaves make good salads when the plants are young, and the greens can be cooked when the plants are older. Beets like cool temperatures between 16 and 18 degrees Celsius. They grow best in full sun and in loose soil that is not too wet. Remove stones from the soil while preparing the ground. And test the soil before adding lime and fertilizer. Some experts say the best fertilizers for beets are low in nitrogen Beet seeds can be planted as soon as the soil is able to be worked at the start of the growing season. Planting them every two to three weeks will provide a continuous harvest into the fall. A horticulture specialist at Iowa State University suggests planting the seeds a little more than one centimeter deep. They should be planted in rows that are spaced 30 to 46 centimeters apart. Overcrowding the plants will mean that the roots cannot spread out and grow. Thin the beets by removing the smaller ones. These can be used as greens. The only work needed once beets have been thinned is weeding and when the weather is dry, a weekly watering. For best results, beets should be picked when they are four to five centimeters across. Beets much larger than that can be tough and have to be cooked for a long time. For VOA Learning English, I'm Laurel Bowman. From VOA Learning English, this is the Agriculture Report. Some people say eating hot chili peppers can help you breathe easier if you have a cold. Others believe that chilies give you more energy. All we know is that people have been growing chilies for centuries. And there are plenty of different kinds of chili peppers to choose from. Want to spice up your meals with homegrown chilies? They need a warm climate. If you plant the seeds outside when the weather is cool, place a glass over them. That will add warmth from the sun and protect them from wind. You can also start the seeds in your home or a greenhouse. If you plant chili peppers inside, fill an 8 centimeter pot with soil. The pot should have holes on the bottom so water can run out. Drop seeds over the surface of the container and cover with a thin layer of vermiculite. Vermiculite is a material that can hold air, water, and nutrients. Then cover the top of the pot with a see-through plastic bag. Hold the bag in place with a rubber band. Place the pot in a warm area. You should take off the bag when the chilies start growing. 
When the plants have reached about two centimeters high, place each one in its own pot. When the roots show through the holes on the bottom of the pot, transplant each seedling into a 12 centimeter pot. When the plants are 20 centimeters high, tie the plants to a stick placed in the pot to support them. When the chili peppers are 30 centimeters high, pull off the tops with your fingers. That should get new branches to grow. When the first flowers show, give the plants some potash fertilizer. When the weather is warm, put them into five liter pots and place them outside. Make sure they get lots of light and water. For VOA Learning English, I'm Alex Villarreal. This is the VOA Special English Agriculture Report. Onions come in different sizes, shapes, colors, and flavors, from mild and sweet to hot and strong. A full-grown onion plant has roots, bulbs, and leaves. The leaves are long, thin, and hollow. They stand straight up and thicken at the bottom to form a bulb. Onions are biennials. Their life cycle is two years long, but they are usually picked during their first year before flowers form and the bulbs stop growing. Onions grow best in loose, fertile soil. They can grow in many different climates. In cooler climates, onions may need 14 to 15 hours of daylight to start forming bulbs. In warmer climates, onions can begin developing bulbs with fewer hours of sun. Barbara Fick is an agriculture expert with Oregon State University. She says a faster way to grow onions is to plant what are called sets. She says onion sets are actually small plants, so growing them does not take as long. Organic material like compost or leaf mulch can help onions grow in heavy soil. The bulbs can be pulled from the ground once their tops have dried and fallen over. Onions can be stored for months, but Barbara Fick says stored onions need to be cured first. Curing is a way of making sure those leaves on the outside are nice and dry, she says. Here are some directions from the National Gardening Association. First, dry the onions in the sun for a day or so. Then bring them out of direct sun for two to three weeks. Spread them out in any warm, airy place that is covered or cover the onions securely with a light cotton sheet. The sheet will keep the sun from burning the bulbs. Do not worry about rain and do not use a plastic or canvas sheet. Heavy coverings will trap moisture and keep the onions from drying fully. Turn the bulbs a couple of times to help them dry evenly. After curing the onions, you can hang them indoors in mesh bags to dry even more. There should be no wet spots on the onions when they are put in storage. The National Gardening Association says the longer onions are cured, the better they will keep. Some people cut off the top leaves before curing onions. If you do that, do not cut the leaves any closer than two and a half centimeters from the bulb. That will keep the top of the onion from drying out and spoiling in storage. 
For more about gardening, go to voaspecialenglish.com. For VOA Special English, I'm Laurel Bowman. This is the VOA Special English Agriculture Report. Many people have lettuce in a salad at the beginning of a meal. The ancient Egyptians and Romans had it at the end. Either way, gardening experts say lettuce is one of the easiest vegetables to grow in a garden. There are hundreds of kinds of head and leaf lettuces besides the most popular choices like iceberg, Boston, bib, and romaine. The best time to plant the seeds is during cool weather. Gardening advisors at the University of Illinois Extension say the best planting temperature is 15 degrees Celsius. You can use a seed tray to start the seeds indoors. The container should be deep enough to hold at least three centimeters of soil. Leave about one centimeter of space between the soil and the top of the container. The container should have holes in the bottom so extra water can flow out. Cover the seeds lightly with soil. If the soil is not already a little wet, give it some water, but not too much. Too much water could drown the seeds. Next, cover the seed tray with paper. Remove the paper when the seedlings are tall enough to touch it. You can transplant the seedlings into the garden when they are about two to three centimeters tall. Do this when the weather is not too hot and not too cold. Take out as much of the soil as you can with the seedlings. Plant them in the ground in a hole that is bigger than the lettuce roots. Keep the plants watered, but not too heavily. Planting seeds every week or two will provide a continuous supply of lettuce to harvest. Harvest leaf lettuces when the leaves are big enough to eat. Pull the leaves from the outside of the plant so the inner leaves will keep growing. Or cut off the whole plant but leave about two or three centimeters so it will regrow. Cut off head lettuces at ground level. Lettuce is best when served fresh. The remainder should be stored in a refrigerator in a plastic bag. Do you grow lettuce or other greens in your garden? Share your gardening stories at voaspecialenglish.com. You can also download daily MP3s and texts of programs to read, listen, and learn English, and much more. Check out the interactive learning in the classroom section. And you can also find us at the VOA Learning English page on Facebook and in the podcast section on iTunes. For VOA Special English, I'm Carolyn Prasuti. I'm Alex Villarreal with the VOA Special English Agriculture Report. Farmers know that if you reduce harmful insects and diseases in your crops, you have a chance for a better harvest. Today, many farmers and experts praise Integrated Pest Management, or IPM. IPM is a series of choices and methods to control insects, diseases, and fungi. The program provides current information on how pests live and act in the environment. 
A number of non-governmental and other organizations in many countries provide education in IPM. Farmers can get information meant for the needs of their own land. They can learn to recognize possible problems and how to plan crops to help prevent failures. Paul Jepson heads the Integrated Plant Protection Center at Oregon State University. He says farmers who have attended field schools in Asia and Africa have increased the use of IPM. And he says this has cut pesticide use. James Frederick is an IPM expert with Clemson University's PD Research and Educational Center in South Carolina. He says one basic IPM method is to plant as early in the season as possible so that most of the crop will be in by the time a disease or pest arrives. Not all insects are pests. Some are helpful. IPM programs help farmers learn to identify different kinds. Another IPM method is rotating crops. Farmers do not plant the same crop season after season in the same soil. Instead, they may plant corn one season, soybeans the next, then corn again. Brenda Vandermeer is also with Clemson University. She says farmers should not endlessly work the same soil without putting back some organic matter. James Frederick says farmers need information about what crops are best to plant. He says that sometimes disease-resistant crops will reduce harvests. He said a last choice would be chemical control. But he suggests using management methods first. Another possible method of pest control is using genetically modified plants. They have had their genes changed to contain a special characteristic, like resistance to certain insects. Brenda Vandermeer says she believes improvements in plants can be very helpful. She noted the example of genetic engineering that makes rice more nutritious by producing beta carotene. For VOA Special English, I'm Alex Villarreal. You can read and download our programs at voaspecialenglish.com. This is the VOA Special English Agriculture Report. George Ballas of Houston, Texas lived a long life. He was a businessman and property developer, a university lecturer and author, a dancer and dance studio owner whose son Corky and grandson Mark followed in his footsteps into the dance world. And Mr. Ballas was the inventor of the weed eater. The man who found an easier way for people to cut grass and weeds died in Houston on June 25th. He was 85 years old. George Ballas was born in Louisiana. He joined the military at 17. He served in World War II and the Korean War. After the military, he became a dance teacher and executive in the dance school industry. In the 1950s, he built a dance studio of his own in Houston. People called it the biggest in the world. Dance City USA had 120 teachers. Mr. Ballas sold the studio in 1964. By the early 70s, he was on to the next big thing. The idea had come to him at a car wash. He watched the needle-like bristles of the brushes as they went round and round against his car. 
Could a similar idea be used to cut grass in places out of reach of someone pushing a lawnmower? To find out, he placed lengths of fishing line through holes in a tin can. He attached the can to the spinning part of a motorized grass edger. The result? A revolution for millions of people who cut grass for a living or just to keep their neighbors happy. George Ballas became known as the Weed King. And he once told the Houston Chronicle, a weed eater comes along once in a lifetime. His invention grew into a company which he later sold. Today, his idea lives on in a new generation of string trimmers and edgers that people often call weed whackers. The noise may not be the nicest, but neither is a loud mower. Trimmers work well in corners and along walls and fences. They also avoid the use of chemicals and the labor of pulling weeds by hand. Of course, in the wrong hands, a weed whacker can do damage like any other power tool. The high speed cutting line can whack pieces out of trees, wood fences, stone surfaces, or bird baths. In 1952, George Ballas married Maria Luisa Miralanda, a flamenco dancer and film actress. They were together for 59 years until his death. For VOA Special English, I'm Carolyn Prasuti. You can find Voice of America's daily news and information service for people learning English at voaspecialenglish.com. This is the VOA Special English Agriculture Report. Ten years ago, David Masika bought a cotton mill in eastern province, Kenya. Mekoeni Jinnerese was operating with technology from the 1960s. It produced only 200 kilos of cotton in its first year under new ownership. Last year, it sold 600,000 kilos, or about 1,000 bales, earning its first profit since Mr. Masika bought it. World prices for cotton are up, but he worried that he might not have enough cotton to process if he invested in new technology. We got into this vicious circle where we then were wondering, do I completely modernize this thing when I do not know whether the cotton is coming? About a year ago, as the cotton supply in Kenya started increasing, he started modernizing half the machinery. Mekueni is one of only four modern ginneries in the country. Kenya's cotton industry used to be strong, but almost 20 years ago, a government agency collapsed. That agency had provided growers with a guaranteed price for cotton. Without that support, prices fell, and so did production. Today, Kenya is part of the African Growth and Opportunity Act. AGOA is an American law, first signed in 2000. It provides duty-free and quota-free treatment for certain clothing and other products from Africa. Kenya says its clothing exports tripled from 2001 to 2006. But Kenya's cotton and textile industry is concerned about meeting future requirements of the law. AGOA countries have been operating under what is called a third country fabric provision. This lets them use yarns and fabrics made in any country, not just AGOA countries. But starting next September, those countries 
must be able to find the raw materials for their products regionally. Kenya's cotton industry wants the United States Congress to extend the third country fabric provision. Micah Poan is chief executive of the Cotton Development Board. He says, if we get an extension period of two or three years by AGOA, I confidently say that we will be able to produce enough cotton to meet local demand to qualify for the AGOA market. African countries face not only a limited cotton supply and poor machinery, they also face problems with making cotton into fabric to produce clothing. Under AGOA, fabric is considered a raw resource that has to come from African countries instead of places like China. For VOA Special English, I'm Carolyn Prasuti. I'm Alex Villarreal with the VOA Special English Education Report. The Southeast Asian English Olympics were held in February in Jakarta, Indonesia. High school and university students competed to demonstrate their English skills at the Anggrek campus of Binus University. The Bina Nusantara English Club at the university started the English Olympics in 2005. The yearly competition was formerly known as the Nationwide English Olympics. This year, the club invited other Southeast Asian schools to send ambassadors to join students from Indonesia. The organizers hoped to have 400 or more students take part. There were six areas of competition. One was based on Scrabble. This is the board game where players try to form words from letters with different point values. Other areas of the competition included speech, storytelling, and newscasting. Students were judged on their ability to present the news. Johannes Napis is the 20-year-old chief executive officer of the Olympics. He says the biggest event was the debate competition, which included international judges. He says the competition used the British parliamentary system, but debaters could use either British or American English. Organizers of the Southeast Asian English Olympics got support from the American Embassy in Jakarta and VOA. The finals took place February 19th in a new high-tech American cultural center called At America. It opened in December in the Pacific Place Mall in Jakarta. 100 Indonesian high school students came to the At America Center. They chose their favorite entry in the sixth area of competition, short movie making. But adult judges chose the winners of the gold, silver, and bronze medals. Johannes Napis says the Southeast Asian English Olympics might expand next year into the Asian English Olympics. He said people from Bangladesh and China wanted to take part in the Southeast Asian English Olympics, but they could not accept them. So he thinks they have a good chance of expanding the competition into other parts of Asia next year. For VOA Special English, I'm Alex Villarreal. Our programs are online with transcripts and MP3 files at voaspecialenglish.com.
www.thepeopleshow.com. You can also comment on this and other stories. And you can find us on Facebook at VOA Learning English.